This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. This reading by Gord Mackenzie. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 10 The day passed much as the day before had done. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, who continued, though slowly, to mend, and in the evening Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing-room. The loo-table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at piquet, and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework, and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady either on his handwriting, or on the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue, and was exactly in union with her opinion of each. "'How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter!' He made no answer. "'You write uncommonly fast.' "'You are mistaken.' I write rather slowly. How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year! Letters of business, too! How odious I should think them! It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of yours. Pray tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her so once, by your desire. I am afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. I mend pens remarkably well. Thank you, but I always mend my own. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table and I think it infinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do not you, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. Oh, cried Miss Bingley, Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words, and blots the rest. My ideas flow so rapidly that I have not time to express them, by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. Your humility, Mr. Bingley, said Elizabeth, must disarm reproof. Nothing is more deceitful, said Darcy, than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion, and sometimes an indirect boast. And which do you two call my little recent piece of modesty? The indirect boast, for you are really proud of your defects in writing, because you consider them as proceeding from rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything with quickness is always prized much by the possessor, and often without any attention to the imperfection of the performance. When you told Mrs. Bennet this morning, that if you ever resolved upon quitting Netherfield, you should be gone in five minutes. You meant it to be a sort of panegyric, of compliment to yourself. And yet what is there so very laudable in a precipitance, 
which must leave very necessary business undone, and can be of no real advantage to yourself or anyone else. Nay, cried Bingley, this is too much, to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet, upon my honour, I believe what I said of myself to be true, and I believe it at this moment. At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of needless precipitance merely to show off before the ladies. I dare say you believed it, but I am by no means convinced that you would be gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know, and if, as you were mounting your horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week, you would probably do it, you would probably not go, and at another word might stay a month. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off now much more than he did himself. I am extremely gratified, said Bingley, by your converting what my friend says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper. But I am afraid you are giving it a turn which that gentleman did by no means intend, for he would certainly think better of me if under such a circumstance I were to give a flat denial and ride off as fast as I could. Would Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intentions as atoned for by your obstinacy in adhering to it? Upon my word, I cannot exactly explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. You expect me to account for opinions which you choose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember Miss Bennet that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house and the delay of his plan has merely desired it, asked it without offering one argument in favour of its propriety. To yield readily, easily, to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you? To yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either. You appear to me, Mr. Darcy, to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection. A regard for the requester would often make one readily yield to a request, without waiting for arguments to reason one into it. I am not particularly speaking of such a case as you have supposed about Mr. Bingley. We may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs before we discuss the discretion of his behaviour thereupon. But in general and ordinary cases between friend and friend, where one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with the desire, without waiting to be argued into it? Will it not be advisable, before we proceed on this subject, to arrange with rather more precision the degree of importance which is to appertain to this request, as well as the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties? "'By all means!' cried Bingley. Let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow in comparison with myself, I should not pay him half so much deference. I declare I do not know a more awful object than Darcy, on particular occasions, and in particular places, at his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening, when he has nothing to do. Mr. Darcy smiled, but Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended, and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received in an expostulation with her brother for talking such nonsense. "'I see your design, Bingley,' said his friend. "'You dislike an argument and want to silence this.' "'Perhaps I do.' Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful, and then you may say whatever you like of me. What you ask, said Elizabeth, is no sacrifice on my side, and Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter. Mr. Darcy took her advice and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth, for an indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with some alacrity to the pianoforte, and, after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way, which the other as politely and more earnestly negatived, she seated herself. 
Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister, and while they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing, as she turned over some music-books that lay on the instrument, how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet that he should look at her, because he disliked her, was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last, that she drew his notice because there was something wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scotch air, and soon afterwards Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, "'Do not you feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to seize such an opportunity of dancing a reel?' She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question with some surprise at her silence. "'Oh!' she said. "'I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste. But I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes, and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare." Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, but there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner which made it difficult for her to affront anybody, and Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. Miss Bingley saw, or suspected enough to be jealous, and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane, received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest, by talking of their supposed marriage, and planning his happiness in such an alliance. "'I hope,' she said, as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue, and if you can compass it, do sure the younger girls of running after officers, and if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavour to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Oh, yes. Do let the portraits of your uncle and Aunt Phillips be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. Put them next to your great uncle, the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not have it taken, for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? It would not be easy indeed to catch their expression. But their color and shape and the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. At that moment they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. "'I did not know that you intended to walk,' said Miss Bingley, in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. "'You used us abominably ill,' answered Mrs. Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness and immediately said, "'This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue.' But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, "'No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about, in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. End of chapter 10
Chapter 11 When the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well guarded from cold, attended her into the drawing-room, where she was welcomed by her two friends with many professions of pleasure, and Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. Their powers of conversation were considerable. They could describe an entertainment with accuracy, relate an anecdote with humour, and laugh at their acquaintance with spirit. But when the gentlemen entered, Jane was no longer the first object. Miss Bingley's eyes were instantly turned toward Darcy, and she had something to say to him before he had advanced many steps. He addressed himself to Miss Bennet with a polite congratulation. Mr. Hurst also made her a slight bow, and said he was very glad, but diffuseness and warmth remained for Bingley's salutation. He was full of joy and attention. The first half-hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room, and she removed at his desire to the other side of the fireplace, that she might be further from the door. He then sat down by her, and talked scarcely to any one else. Elizabeth, at work in the opposite corner, saw it all with great delight. When the tea was over, Mr. Hurst reminded his sister-in-law of the card-table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hurst soon found even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hurst had therefore nothing to do but to stretch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book, Miss Bingley did the same, and Mrs. Hurst, principally occupied in playing with her bracelets and rings, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy's progress through his book as in reading her own, and she was perpetually either making some inquiry or looking at his page. She could not win him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn, and said, "'How pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way! I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than of a book! When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library.' No one made any reply. She then yawned again, threw aside her book, and cast her eyes round the room in quest for some amusement. When hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, "'By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us who a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure. "'If you mean Darcy,' cried her brother, "'he may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing, and as soon as Nichols has made white soup enough, I shall send round my cards.' "'I should like balls infinitely better,' she replied, "'if they were carried on in a different manner. But there is something insufferably tedious in the usual process of such a meeting. It would surely be much more rational if conversation instead of dancing were made the order of the day. Much more rational, my dear Caroline, I dare say, but it would not be near so much like a ball. Miss Bingley made no answer, and soon afterwards she got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well. But Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth, said, "'Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example, and take a turn about the room. 
I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. Elizabeth was surprised, but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up. He was as much awake to the novelty of attention in that quarter as Elizabeth herself could be, and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join their party, but he declined it, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together, with either of which motives his joining them would interfere. What could he mean? She was dying to know what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all, was her answer. But depend upon it, he means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of disappointing Mr. Darcy in anything, and persevered, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. "'I have not the smallest objection to explaining them,' said he, as soon as she allowed him to speak. "'You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are in each other's confidence, and have secret affairs to discuss, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking.' If the first, I would be completely in your way, and if the second, I can admire you much better as I sit by the fire. Oh, shocking! cried Miss Bingley. I never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Nothing so easy if you have but the inclination, said Elizabeth. We can all plague and punish one another. Tease him, laugh at him. Intimate as you are, you must know how it is to be done. But upon my honour I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not yet taught me that. Tease, calmness of manner, and presence of mind? No, no, feel he may defy us there. And as to laughter, we will not expose ourselves, if you please, by attempting to laugh without a subject. Mr. Darcy may hug himself." Mr. Darcy is not to be laughed at, cried Elizabeth. That is an uncommon advantage. And uncommon I hope it will continue, for it would be a great loss to me to have many such acquaintances. I dearly love a laugh. Miss Bingley, said he, has given me more credit than can be. The wisest and the best of men, nay, the wisest and best of their actions, may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, replied Elizabeth, there are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies, do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for any one, but it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule, such as vanity and pride. Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed, but pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will be always under good regulation. Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. "'Your examination of Mr. Darcy is over, I presume?' said Miss Bingley. "'And pray, what is the result?' "'I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. "'He owns it himself without disguise.' "'No,' said Darcy. "'I have made no such pretension. "'I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. "'My temper I dare not vouch for. "'It is, I believe, too little yielding, certainly too little for the convenience of the world. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought, nor their offences against myself. My feelings are not puffed about with every attempt to move them. My temper would perhaps be called resentful. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. That is a failing indeed, 
cried Elizabeth. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is to hate everybody? And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my waking Mr. Hurst? Her sister had not the smallest objection, and the pianoforte was opened, and Darcy, after a few moments' recollection, was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. End of chapter 11